Could the woman I'm going to be chatting with in this podcast be doing the stupidest research in the history of human biomechanical research? And what can we learn about natural movement from people who don't move naturally at all? Well, we're going to find out both of those things on today's episode of the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting with the feet first, those things that are your foundation. We're going to break down the mythology, the propaganda, sometimes the outright lies that you've been hearing about what it takes to dance, to run, to walk, to hike, to move, to, well, anything you can think of, um, well, feet first, but doing it enjoyably and healthily and efficiently. I am Stephen Sashin, your host um, and the CEO of ZeroShoes.com. Uh, you know the drill. If you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. That means go to jointhemovementmovement.com. If you don't know where to find us, where you can then like and share and uh, click the bell if you're watching on YouTube and um, leave reviews. And if you have any questions, drop an email to move at Join the movement, movement.com. Anyway, let's jump into the woman doing the stupidest research in the world. Um, Sarah Ridge, it is such a treat to have you here. Hello. Hello. Thank you uh, for having me. <laughs> oh, no, of course, it's my pleasure. I've been trying to make this happen for a while, and we're going to have competition today for who has the biggest flyaway hair thing. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think it's going to be me today. I don't know what the hell yeah. happened. If I were still on the East Coast, though, totally. Oh, that. oh my God. I can't <laughs> live on the East Coast. Um, anymore. That's where I grew up, but I mean, I had short hair on the East Coast. Now that it's doing this, uh, I look like Bozo the Clown. Yeah. It, is, it gets Terrible. ridiculous. <laughs> um, why don't you do me a favor and tell human beings who the hell you are, and then we'll jump into the fun. All right. Um, I'm Sarah Ridge. I am a faculty member at Brigham Young University in the exercise science department. I teach biomechanics classes, um, and I do research. Um, I do biomechanics research. Um, mostly concentrating these days on the foot um, and then also on um, injury prevention and of like overuse injuries and things like that. Cool. Well, we're going to jump into your stupid research in just a minute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but first, um, I like to share a movement thing that people can do. And we, we talked about this before we jumped on. And then I suddenly thought of one that I wanted to do. So I'm usurping your opportunity to share okay. a movement thing with people. Um, and I'm going to do this one. Uh, so if you're Anywhere that you can do this, cross your arms. You can do this too. Okay. Cross your arms, okay? Simple, no big deal. You do it without even thinking. Now here's what I want you to do next. Cross your arms the other way. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Cross your arms. Okay, wait, hold on. The that way. one's under, and then, why can I not think of this? I know. No. You got it? That was the same way. This one goes on. <laughs> there, I got it. <laughs> oh wait, here, hold on. I think I have a secret for doing it. So my hand, so my arm is right. Uh, my right arm is is uh, the one that's further out. So yep. if I take it out and then yep. put it underneath, and yeah, then there you go. My left hand and put it under. Okay, there it goes. <laughs> See, it still wants to sneak out. Anyway, right. Yeah, so <laughs> this is one of these interesting things. We get into these very simple movement patterns, and we don't even think about what it takes to to do something really, really simple like cross your arms the other way. I've actually gotten to the point where I can't remember which is my normal way. Um, the other one you can do is put on your pants the wrong way. I don't mean, you know, backwards facing forward, although that's pretty entertaining. Um, but uh, I just, you know, like uh, I'm normally a left foot first person. Oh. So try doing right foot first. I'm such right. a right foot first person. How is that possible? That makes no sense. Why would, you, why would anybody do that? <laughs> I know, right? Absurd. All the time. <laughs> so try these things. Basically look for anything that you think you do habitually. Try it the other way around. Try eating with the fork in the other hand. Try using you know, your knife in the other hand. Try, there's other things that I can think of that you would do with one hand and not the other that you could do the other way around that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but when I had my, you know, my shoulder surgery and I couldn't use my right arm, I got good at some of those and you're making up the story of what you think those are. So <laughs> suffice it to say, I will give this one. I can, you know, if I'm in a public bathroom and the toilet paper is on either side, it doesn't <laughs> matter anymore. I, yeah. I can handle that. <laughs> so it's so good to be adaptable. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and you know, and there's, but it's fascinating to me how we do lay down these neural pathways for certain really habitual movements um, without yeah. ever thinking about it. One of my favorite things, I, I thought that everyone tied their shoes the same way. Uh -huh. uh, I've now watched thousands and thousands of people, and I have seen oh, yeah. thousands of ways of tying your shoes. Yeah, who knew? Yeah. One, I'll have to record these someday and show all of them. And you will undeniably think that all of the ones that aren't like yours are ridiculous. Super weird. Yeah. Like, okay. why would you do that? That makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. I, I'm really curious now because I can't 
like imagine more than maybe three ways to tie your shoe. Okay, well, here's one that you probably never thought of. Uh -huh. um, so you take each lace independently and make two yeah. loops, separate yeah. loops, and then tie those in a knot. Isn't that the bunny thing? When you're teaching a kid and like you make bunny ears, and then oh. the one bunny goes, I think that's, yeah. Oh yeah, that probably is. About, yeah. So, I mean, I don't do it because like, I think that's more complicated, but I feel like that's so. I think you're right. I think like, that is the bunny ear method. Yeah. yeah, but then, right. And then the normal way. Well, and, and my normal way. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and then, the normal way. Well, and here's another one. Look at how you tie your shoes and in the same way with crossing your arms, look and yeah. see which lace you put oh, yeah. over the other and switch it and see if you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, that'll mess you up. Yeah. I, I want to hear from people who um, try this and uh, and whose lives I've ruined by just pointing out that there is another way. Um, yeah. And if you're a Republican, you definitely do it, you know, right over left. If you're a Democrat, you do left over right. That's really right. now I'm afraid to cross my arms again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and they'll suddenly you can start on, you know, which leg we cross. And I, it gets, right, right, yeah. right. I want to jump in and talk about your stupid research. Great. Now, Here's, here's why I call it your stupid research, and this will not be surprising to you. Um, one of the things that made you well known in the natural movement community was the research that I'm gonna ask you to talk about, about foot strengthening and uh, natural movement or just uh, minimalist shoes, truly minimalist shoes versus a foot strengthening exercise. And the reason that I call this the stupidest research ever done is because it's amazing that we have to try to do research to demonstrate something like, if you use your feet, they can get stronger. Right. And if you don't use them, not so much. In fact, do you know, I, I asked Irene Davis about this. Someone's got some research coming out where they took normal people, put them in with an orthotic in their shoe and mm -hmm. saw the exact opposite of strengthening, AKA weakening. Yes. Do you know, do you know who I'm talking about? Um, I cannot remember who oh, I should be able to remember the author, but I don't, um, but I know the paper you're talking about. And, and the gist is not surprising. You don't yeah. let your foot move. It gets weaker. Yeah. What a shock. Yeah. But yeah. you know, we have to prove this for incredible reasons. Yeah. So talk to me, so talk about what your research was and what you discovered. And then I just want to hear like how the hell is you got into all of this and you know, why are you doing this? Who are you, Sarah? <laughs> um, so yeah, so I often think like, it, you know, do I really even have a story to tell, you know, about this research? Because it seems so obvious. Like why would, why would, I don't know, why wouldn't you think that your feet would get stronger if you, allow yourself to use them, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but um, what we did was we took um, about 60 healthy runners um, and- Wait, I wanna pause right there. Oh, yes. I just love that you had a cohort, a sample size that was something decent. The, you know, most of the research that I've seen that's sort of anti-natural movement, we took six people who are habitual barefoot runners and they weren't, right. you know, yeah. they're people who've done some barefoot training, but they're not anybody that I've ever met um, in the yeah. barefoot world. So I love that you've got like a real group of human beings. Thank you. It was, it, it took a long time. Oh, really? <laughs> but it did. It took us probably, I'm going to say, it took us a couple years, I think, to get everybody. Now, you know, so we had an eight week training protocol. Right. Um, and well, maybe I'll step back and like okay. outline the study and then I'll tell you why, you know, part of the reasons that it took us so long. But um, so we had 60 healthy runners. Um, we split them into three groups. So um, we had a group that just did their normal running, um, wore their normal shoes and really was not bothered by the study whatsoever other than coming in and checking in with us and um, you know, weekly. And then at the beginning and the end of the study, doing um, our testing, our measurements. Um, then we had another group that did specific progressive foot strengthening exercises. So they started um, it was a foot strengthening program that was developed by Irene, um, by Irene Davis in their lab. Um, and and we'll, 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 we'll get into that in the, later and okay. probably in the show notes, put a link to what that is. Perfect. Um, and so they, over eight weeks, they did more difficult um, exercises that were targeted specifically to the feet. Is it hard um, to find tiny little barbells to use with your toes? It tongue? is. It's really hard, <laughs> but they're really cute when you get them. <laughs> um, and then our third group was the minimalist footwear group. And, and what we did with that group was we just had them replace a certain number of steps that they would normally take in their regular shoes with steps in minimalist shoes. Just walking. 
just walking. Yep. So nobody ever ran in minimalist footwear and nobody changed anything about their running over that eight week protocol um, because we actually were not interested in the running part at all. Um, we just used healthy runners because it's a rel relatively, relatively easy population to get around here. Um, and because our, the study that had led to this was in runners. Um, so we kind of kept with that population thinking we may go to figuring out a transition protocol um, to running in minimalist footwear, but then we decided that, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, sorry. Something is happening. Yes, it's very exciting. Scoot over uh -oh. here, because, yeah. okay, this is Wayne Johnson. Hey, Wayne. Hello. <laughs> Another author on this that paper <laughs> that we were just ah, So there's a reason for your existence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, well, yes. well, hey, welcome, Wayne. And um, do you want to do a quick intro of who the hell you are? Okay, yeah. So I'm Wayne Johnson. I'm a um, professor here at Brigham Young University, and my background's in physical therapy and rehabilitation. I've been doing research with Dr. Ridge on the foot for the last number of years. Do you make everyone call you Dr. Ridge? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mistress no. of biomechanics. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Respectful. <laughs> Unlike some people. <laughs> I actually do the opposite. Um, my dad was a medical pro professional, and so um, everyone I knew who were doctors, we never called them doctor anything. So when right. I deal with all of my doctors, I refer to them the way I would refer to anybody who's roughly my age and call them by right. their name, which makes their uh, employees very uncomfortable. <laughs> which is it's another true. reason that I do it. It's very entertaining. Sure, okay, so backing up then, and okay. you can you know, jump in whoever wants to talk about it. So we've got three groups of runners, uh, one group who just did whatever the hell they were doing. Did they get paid the same as the people who are actually in the interventions? Man, yeah. I want to be, I want to be getting paid to do nothing different. I know, right? That's a great gig. <laughs> All right. People yes, who did nothing. get to walk in minimalist shoes. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, people who did the foot strengthening program, people who just walked uh, in, spent some time walking in minimalist shoes. And then what happened? What did you discover? So what we were testing was we wanted to see, um, we looked at foot muscle size and foot muscle strength um, from baseline before they started the study until um, they were done the eight weeks of the intervention or not as the control group. Um, and we found that both the minimalist footwear group and the exercise group um, increased foot muscle size and foot muscle strength just about the same amount, in fact. So, and then the control group didn't there was no change in the control group. Right. So either intervention resulted in increases in uh, foot muscle size and strength. And this is, this is something that I love. So, so some people um, misinterpreted that and said, well, you know, then clearly there's no benefit in wearing minimalist shoes. Like, no, 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 no. It's the other way around is that by wearing a minimalist shoe and just walking, you're getting as strong as you could get with a concentrated exercise program. Um, did you think in advance to do a fourth cohort that was the combo? No. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. <I> well, <laughs> well why didn't you help her with that? <laughs> we would have had to get 20 more people. <laughs> so, so how, so talk to me about how difficult it is to get 60 people to put to, you know, for a study. Um, it was not easy. <laughs> we had a lot of dropout. I mean, I guess our dropout rates probably weren't that much higher than most other studies, right. you know, 10, 15%. For an intervention study for two months. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, things, I mean, people would drop out, like they would get injured for other reasons. Right. You know? And then obviously that means they have to drop out of the study. Um, or, I mean, we are at a university, we used a lot of college students and, you know, they got really busy or something and like this was not a priority anymore. Well, um, at, at you know, BYU, yeah. there's not going to be a lot of college students who dropped out because they were just drunk or. No, <laughs> no, not very many of those. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, they, you know, there was, I'm trying to think of other other reasons. Um, I feel like we lost people to unrelated injury, mm. which makes sense too. I mean, they're healthy, active people. Right. So, you know, like, well, that's an, I, this is an, I mean, I'm sure you don't have the, the data on this or I imagine you don't, but was, uh, was it the control group and the non minimalist group or that were, was any group getting injured more often than another? No, we don't have that. In the so. study. We did. Yeah, I didn't think you were looking uh, at that, yeah. but I'm just wondering anecdotally. Well, of the people who withdrew from the study, yeah. um, I don't think, I mean, we know what groups those people were in. I don't think there was anything really different about the groups. Got it. Yeah. So um, let's talk about, I mean, again, I find it utterly amazing that we have to 
practice in some way. Do research to yeah. like tell you that you're going to get stronger. Yeah. And how did you, so to let people know, how did you measure both the uh, muscle size and muscle strength? Um, so I'll let you. Yeah. So muscle, muscle size, size we measured with ultrasound imaging. We have a protocol that we've developed. Um, we also did some MRI, but that was for another reason. Um, so we measured that with ultrasound imaging with the cross-sectional area change in most of those muscles. And then strength testing. So let me, I just want to pause there. So basically what this is, and I'm doing the English to English translation. So the gist is, you know, what you're seeing, the cross-sectional, imagine just a tube and now the tube just got wider. Yes. Or, you know, yeah, exactly. Bigger diameter, yeah. bigger circumference. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. And then strength wise, we have a device that we developed that measures toe flexion strength and uh, the doming or short foot action. So I'm dying to know what this seeming in my head, this is a torture device. Um, what is it? What is it? What do you do? How does it work? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, so with the toe flexion, you, um, you put your foot, let's see, we just have a foot in like, it's kind of a wood device. I could show you a picture if you want to link that somehow or yeah, whatever. Sure. Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, you put your foot in kind of this wood frame and then we have um, a force transducer on one end and then we use various devices to connect that to a carabiner, which then you grip with your big toe uh, and then tighten it enough. You're gripping with the, you're gripping the, you're holding the, the beaner with your toe. Right. Yes. Okay. And then we, so we do one, that's great toe flexion only. Yeah. And then we do another one where we do the same thing, but we have a different connection. So that one is like a bar. Right. And, and then that one goes between your second and third toes. And then you're pulling on that bar with your lateral oh, okay. toes. Generally yeah. two, three, four, the pinky toe doesn't usually get over that. On no, the bar. Not so much. Uh, so who was the crazy person who thought these um, cool devices up? Yeah, we <laughs> the bar goes horizontal across your fingers. So you're pulling just on the bar right fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So yeah, we did that. It it <laughs> seemed to work. Yeah. So we have some other like we we have a couple of papers. I don't remember if the other one's out yet. <laughs> anyway, about that, yeah, looking at reliability of those. Yeah. Um, and then the doming one, yeah. it's another device um, where they put their foot in like a Brannock device, like the shoe sizer. Right. Okay. So they put their foot in there and then we have um, a strap that goes over yeah. the top of that. Okay. And they lift up and that strap then pulls on the load cell. Down. Got it. So basically you, what they're just uh, again, describe it. So you're contracting your arch and short foot is something that we've shared uh, with people a number of times on this podcast. Yeah. Um, but if you haven't heard it, you're basically trying, it's like an isometric thing in a way where you're trying to pull like the ball of your big, your big toe towards your heel, but you're not actually moving anything. But when you do that, it engages your arch and makes the top of your foot lift up. So, right. and it's a great exercise to do if you haven't done it, you can do it everywhere, sitting, standing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm dying to know if anyone has tried to commercialize uh, either of these devices. Um, so I'm not sure how much of a um, call there is for very, these. Very small market. Yes, yeah. small, small market. But very but committed market. <laughs> People who want their feet to get stronger and people who just like feet. Yes. Right. <laughs> we've been working we've been working with a company in New Jersey to um, have them make this device yeah. and like take it over because we actually made one for Irene um, for their lab. But you know, like the I don't know, it's hard to standardize. That's not that's right. Not thing. We're not, you know, we're not yeah. engineers, we're not like, you know, yeah. salespeople, whatever. Um, and so I'd love for this company to take over creating them and standardizing them and selling them to whoever it is that wants them. <laughs> I, I, there, was a, there was one of the early barefoot running pioneers whose name is escaping me right now. He was running barefoot in Boulder in the 70s, um, physical therapist, and he developed a device that basically just wraps around your entire foot and ankle and has like four places where you can hook bungee cords so that you can, th that you then attach to the door basically and oh, inversion and eversion and, you know, flexion and, um, and, and, and it's a really clever thing, but it really is like a weird medieval torture device when you, yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's, you know, there's that, there's that issue. Yeah. Um, do you have any, uh, given the results of that, why, let me just throw it out this way. After you published the study, what happened? Um, I mean, there's definitely been interest, um, in, you know, in the results. I think that to me, the biggest thing is that, um, we really started looking, 
when we started the study, our intention was to look at the transition to running in minimalist footwear. Right. Um, but I think at the, over the course of the time that we were doing the study and then after the study, we've really been more now looking at, okay, clearly just walking in these shoes changes your foot. So what is that going to do for normal healthy people or not healthy people, but like right. what can walking do in, um, you know, or what it's strengthening the foot period. Like what is, what will that do to hopefully prevent like foot pathologies and things from developing? It, it, yeah, I mean, this is the magic question um, is, is if, it, and this is the thing that people, it's funny. So first they want you to prove anything. Now, of course, the thing that's, that, that uh, I guess the, the elephant in the room, if you will, is that had your study been done, oh, a couple of years earlier, there would have been no lawsuit against Fibram. <laughs> Well, so. you know, at that time that there was a lawsuit against Fibra, we were doing our first study yeah. where we've actually had people um, transition into the Vibrams just the way that, like, we didn't actually really pre um, uh, prescribe too much of a transition. Right. It was Other kind of what the Vibram webpage said. Yeah, yeah, it was it was their ten percent for a couple of weeks and then as comfortable kind of thing. Right. And, um, and that study we found um, bone stress injuries in the foot of people or in the feet of people who were transitioning it was about half of the group that transitioned to minimalist to the beavers it's an interesting thing yeah what did you say the majority of women that got the injury oh that's interesting yeah i mean you know i don't I, I don't remember that protocol very clearly other than when i first looked at it i remember thinking well that's not good um, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's funny because, like, we went, we published the muscle size. So we put, we looked at the bone stress stuff using MRI, and then right. a few years later, we got we published the muscle size changes right, from right. that study because we did see that the minimalist footwear group increased muscle size, right, um, ten to fifteen percent. And so, um, and when that one went for review, one of the reviewers was like, how can you do this to people? You should put people through this protocol. And we're like, okay, we didn't, we, it is the exact same study, you know, right. like it's just a different data set from this previous study. Oh, that's um, but yeah. yeah, we're like, yeah, nobody would do that. Like even within that span of those like two years. Um, and as we were doing the first study, that's when the Beaverham lawsuit was happening. Um, and yeah, so, you know, a couple of years later, nobody would have done it. Yes. No, 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 no. It's, it really is outrageous. But I mean, so like the first thing is, okay, is there any value? And the second thing people want to know is, um, so is there going to be any value in terms of injury prevention um, and, uh, or recovery? And people don't realize, I mean, look, you had such a hard time just getting 60 people for this study. People don't realize how hard it would be to put together a good study that's long enough to really determine, right. you know, what the story is about, um, uh, injury prevention. But of course, the thing that people are overlooking is, again, it's not our job. You know, we're not the intervention. The, for the first 9,950 years that human beings were making footwear, it, it looked like, you know, something minimalist, something to protect your foot, something to hold that on your mm -hmm. foot. So I always say, like, when I was at the American College of Sports Medicine, I kept asking the guys from Brooks and Adidas, like, well, where's your proof for anything you just said? And you know, <laughs> that's when the topic changes. So it, it, it's amazing that, again, we're having to prove things about what bodies do naturally when the companies that do unnatural things are not held to the same standards. Yeah. Or when they are, um, the research does not, air, does not land in their favor and somehow people just don't hear about it. Yeah. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if you saw it, but at, at that ACSM thing, um, the guys from Brooks and Adidas both made some comment about how, well, we don't have research that backs up some of the things we're saying. And I've got a slide. It's like, well, here's 40 studies about uh -huh. you know natural movement that show the value of that yeah. or studies that show that extra padding does not does not actually reduce impact forces or all the various things that are you know against what modern shoe companies say it's like i don't know why you're not quoting this stuff yeah so. well and i think that you know there's so many different situations um, that people are testing in. And one of the things with the footwear companies is, you know, everything's proprietary. And right. so like, even if they, whatever research they are doing, it, they, you know, they do share very little of their own research. Um, so, um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's interesting, like when you look at how um, running footwear had developed, right? Mm -hmm. Like, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, like how it, you know, kind of developed, which is 
a little bit of happenstance in many well, ways. Well, wait, do you, you know. do you know the story of how we ended up with, with elevated padded heels? The cushioning, the cushioned yeah. heels. Yeah, do you know how that happened? Um, yeah, I feel like it was something kind of random, wasn't it? I can't remember now. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually better <laughs> slash worse. Um, <laughs> So some uh, Nike was in a building that they shared with some, I think, orthopedic podiatrists or sports podiatrists. And Bowerman was getting runners with Achilles tendonitis. And he said, you know, what do we do? And they said, oh, well, wow. clearly their Achilles have shortened from wearing high heel dress shoes just in their daily life. Oh. So we need to pad, you know, elevate the heel and put some padding under there to protect their heel and their Achilles. And of course, you know, your heel is, well, once you do that, you can't avoid, but land, you can't avoid landing on your heel mm -hmm. your calcaneus your heel is a ball so now you're unstable so now you need motion control by the mm -hmm. time your foot hits the ground it's fully extended so your plantar fascia are in a weak position when you need them to be strong so basically that one intervention was sort of the cause of everything now the footwear industry i can tell you is just a bunch of copycats mm -hmm. if something starts to sell everybody tries to rush to make money off that same idea because they don't want all the money to go to that guy mm -hmm. uh, and and really if you look in the last 50 years the only things that people have been changing is the type and amount of cushioning. I mean, it's still the same basic idea, elevate your heel, cushioning, motion control, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, so there's a guy that I know who was at Nike for a long time who was at a track meet with one of these podiatrists and said, you know, so, you know, your idea has become the de facto standard, standard for <laughs> footwear. You know, what do you think? And his response was a uh, biggest mistake we ever made. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, you know, it's a smoking gun. It yeah. really, it really, and people don't know this. And now everyone's just trying, like at this, again, this ACSM thing, the, the guy from, uh, uh, that one of the questions was, you know, what's in the future? And both the guys from Adidas and Brooks had the same basic idea, which is, you know, everybody's a unique special snowflake. So we're making something just for them. So Adidas was, they want to do their 3D molded midsole or their 3D printed midsole some form of cushioning. Um, and then uh, Brooks was, you know, some, some special outsole where they practically admitted that their goal is to give you a different shoe for everything you're doing. So you need oh, a special shoe for walking into the bathroom, a different shoe for walking <laughs> out of the bathroom and, um, and probably a different shoe for taking a dump. So, you know, that was really there. And, and I think one of them even said, you know, it's kind of a marketing thing. So, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what a yeah. shock. So, yeah. but I mean, it's kind of like, um, like uh, Ben O'Nig, they both quoted him and uh, at the very beginning saying, well, everyone has a preferred movement pattern and it's really impossible to change that. And I spoke to Benno's son, Sandro, and I was about to kind of rip him one about this ridiculous idea. And he said, well, what my dad meant was, yeah, if you're in the same basic shoe, you're going to move the same basic way. Mm -hmm. Being in something that's a 12 millimeter heel drop versus eight millimeters is not a big difference. But okay. my dad would, would be the first one to admit that if you just switch to barefoot, something's going to change. Right. Right. So yeah. these guys, it's just, you know, rearranging deck chairs, deck chairs on the Titanic uh -huh. and, and wondering why, you know, nothing has really changed. Yeah. Um, so it's, and, and the biggest one that amazes me, and I don't know how this one happened, is pointy toes. Like, <laughs> what the hell? Yes. <laughs> who, who thought that idea up? Right. Like, I, I mean, it clearly it became fashionable somewhere at some yeah. time. Right. I, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, that one's a mystery. Yeah. Did you did you get any feedback from big shoe people or any anyone who's sort of anti natural movement? Um, not really. Not I mean, I, I yeah, of. I feel like it's been pretty. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe people approach it as the stupidest research ever. I don't know. No, <laughs> I, I feel like it's been pretty like. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, th I think it's actually the opposite. I think that sadly, um, that you know, the that when there's any research that somehow comes out seemingly in favor of let's call them modern athletic shoes, it's put out by companies who have a lot of money who can push it through. Like there was something in the in the paper today in or on CNN.com that I think it's Papa John's has a new dough recipe. Mm -hmm. Really? This is news? Who gives a crap? <laughs> right. But in the same vein, you know, any big national or multinational company, when they have some new product, suddenly that's news for some reason, because there's uh -huh. enough people using the product that, you know, it's a thing. So, yeah. but on the minimalist side, you know, there are no companies that are big enough that they, ha that we have enough sway with the media to make something newsworthy. So when right. something comes out like your research or um, Irene's research on quote partial minimalist shoes, the stuff that mo the big companies call minimalist that really aren't, uh, right. or Christine Pollard showing that, that more cushioning is actually worse for you. Um, yeah. You know, th these things don't get any attention because yeah. 
there's no money behind it to, to get the word out. And of course, many of many places that you'd want to get that published uh, are getting advertising dollars from big shoe companies. Huh, interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I will say like, so our, the Vibram study, when we did that one, the running transition. That got attention. That got a yeah, ton a of attention. attention. And then, yeah. and this one really didn't. Um, I mean, yeah, it's still yeah, relatively it's, new. It is, but, but like that other one, like it hit and like, you know, it, it hit, and again, you know, like the thing that if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, but my, uh, did, did it matter which Vibram shoe they were wearing? Um, we had them all in, we had them mostly in the same style. Do you um, know which? Uh, no, it was like the original or the right, I don't, it was like the lowest end one. Okay. Whatever. And then some people <laughs> had, some people had, so those had like a big opening Right. But right. Some people did have one that covered strap. the top of the foot, but Without I can't. Strap, with the yeah. Velcro strap, yeah, but I don't yeah, yeah. Um, You know, the, the thing that I, I've noticed some interesting things um, in that product more than any other that I've seen. And, and this is the thing that, that um, I got in an argument where someone said, well, your argument is going to be that it was about their form, not their footwear. And I, and I said, yeah. <laughs> like, what? I said, no, that's, that, that's definitely my argument because I saw so many people who would get in that shoe. Uh, and do one of two things, either continue running the same way they were in regular shoes, right. uh, or worse, where they would still overstride, their foot's about to land way in front of their body, and then they would just point their toes, plantar flex, uh -huh. thinking that you know, you're supposed to land on, your, on the ball of your foot, and so they're landing with all this massive force uh, yeah. on, uh, on those metatarsals, which is not the way you're supposed to run. So it's like, unless you're controlling for form, then then I mean, what you're pointing out really is that this transition program sucks, right? Not necessarily yeah. that the shoes suck, exactly. right? Exactly, and that was really our take home from yeah. that was like, I, you know, we can't even tell you like if it's good or bad to run in minimalist footwear because the transition is so important and not, and that was not defined at the time, right? One of the other things that came but out, we of did this, see an increase in muscle size, <laughs> so they were yeah. in their muscles more, yeah. Oh, interesting. We did. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> um, one of the other things with that study. Wait, hold on, wait. I got to ask. Yeah. Do you know if um, Do you know if the incidence of stress fractures or stress related events was higher than it would than it would be in a control group in a normal population? Um, we had a we had a control. We had group a control group. Imagine, you, okay. They had one injury, and the other group had nine or ten injuries. Got it. Okay. So the other thing is these injuries um, are stress injuries so, um, that the runner didn't necessarily feel there were, there were two stress fractures, two but plate. some of them were injuries where the runners didn't feel them, but because we were doing MRIs, oh, the interesting. radiologists saw them and the radiologists, we had three radiologists read them and yeah. they all said that if they had seen that on an image of a patient, they would have told the patient they needed to alter their um, training or whatever, alter activity somehow. So that's what we qualified as an injury. Oh, interesting. It was a scale from zero to five mm -hmm. and anything to, wait, was it two, three? I think two I think to it was five zero or to three. Four. Oh, zero to four, that's right. That's five five numbers, five levels, yeah. right. <laughs> and um, two, three, and four were considered injury, even if the, subject would yeah, not have said that injury. that's fascinating i wonder yeah. if those subjects who weren't who weren't having a, a personal experience of any problem if right. they adapted over another you know let's say another eight weeks and right. actually that stress incident would have vanished basically yeah exactly and, and that's have. yeah that was one of the things that we really don't know especially in that like two level yeah. was that the good response right you know, that then was going to lead to the strengthening right at the three level they would have they said they would have told the person to stop what they were doing not like i think at the two level they said they would modify activity at the three level they would have told the person to stop the activity and the four was a stress fracture the so, stress thing the stress thing is that. Stress is such an interesting thing, especially um, muscle stress or, or, or um, bone stress, because like you were just alluding to, there is a, um, there is a, um, 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 God, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for. Um, well, there's a hormetic response. So basically, yeah, there's a response. You get a certain amount of stress in your body responds to that. I had a DEXA scan a while ago and my bone density from you know, like the pelvis down is just through the roof because I'm a sprinter. So I'm just applying, you know, tons and tons of force. But I'm sure at a certain point when I was just getting started, um, it yeah. would have looked like I was going to end up, you know, osteoporotic or so or in right. bad shape. Um, but now yeah. it's the exact opposite. And, yeah. um, 
uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. I want to jump um, jump ahead to the other thing that I alluded to, which is you know what can we learn from people who um, are not doing anything resembling natural <laughs> movement? And this is something that you've been wanting to study for a while and are now, and that is um, figure skaters, <laughs> which is could not be further apart or further away from minimalist footwear wearers. Um, unless you know you took like one of our shoes and stuck razor blades on it, um, right. and that would be kind of close. <laughs> Unique. <laughs> has any wait? Has anyone ever tried to make a uh, an ice skating shoe or something that would allow you to skate that was in any way flexible? Yes, in fact. Really? <laughs> that colleague is not here today. Yeah. <laughs> I would call him down the oh, hall. Man, <laughs> how? That's really cool. So, so um, our our colleague um, Dustin Bruning, who also actually might not have been on that paper. Anyway, Dustin's master's thesis was um, developing a, an articulated figure skating boot. So like ski boots have the hinge at the ankle, yeah, yeah. theoretically at the ankle. Um, he, they went through, he and our um, old advisor, um, Jim Richards, went through and figured out like sort of axis of rotation of the ankle and then told this boot company where they should place the articulation a number of issues because the it's not like a, it's not an easy access to sure. model. Um, <clears throat> and so they went, Boot Company built um, a bunch of these articulated skates. They had um, skaters um, train in them and skate in them for a little bit. And they did see um, a lot of the skaters decreased their landing forces when in the articulated boot, which makes sense. You now have an actual flexion range of motion, but right. it still had support on the sides so that you wouldn't okay. have medial lateral motion. Um, but um, there were some interesting things with that. So they used um, experienced, um, experienced skaters mostly, and a lot of them had a really, really hard time Adjust transitioning. Those, yeah. yeah. And like I skated in them, so I was a figure skater way back in the day, and I skated in them a couple of times, and it was weird because you're used to being able to like support yourself by pushing against the boot. Uh, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now I couldn't. It was weird. <laughs> so they did. Um, so there was definitely some issues with that. Um, the other thing was they actually one of the national champions um, wore them. Um, she had been getting injured a lot, and then she she wore these articulated boots, um, and she did really well, um, but <laughs> I think there's also some, you know, as I said, design issues and difficulty with, you know, placing the um, ankle joint axis right where it really should be. Right. And so they, the boots would break um, because you're oh. placing so much torque that like they would, like it would pop out and things. And so um, eventually I think they sold them for about a year or two and then Interesting. they stopped selling them. Um, but I'm yeah. I'm assuming that, I mean, I'm working on the assumption. I, I remember with, with speed skaters, they were using this clap skate, sort of this clap uh -huh. um, um, uh, blades. Um, but, you know, they're not wearing anything that provides a bunch of ankle support. They're wearing something that looks more right. like a sprinting spike with a razor blade on the bottom, which is why what people don't really get, I, I, know, I have a couple of friends who are, who are speed skaters, and every one of them has a story of, I fell down, hit the pads, and the skate hit uh, my inner thigh, and, and cut down, a, yeah. an ephemeral artery, and I nearly bled out. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that is like a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they're wearing skates that are not providing, quote, ankle support. Has it, right. Is there anyone who's actually tried figure skating in a skate like that with a shorter blade, obviously? Um, not that I am aware of. Um, I think, you know, so skating is such an old school aesthetic sport and yeah. they, things have to look a certain way. And that was actually one of the other reasons with the articulated boots, they were thicker right. than um, regular skates. And so some people, especially with these like tiny skinny little girls, then like, you know, their leg would be this big and then the boot <laughs> is like twice as big, you know, it right. looks weird. Um, but, um, you know, so the changing the aesthetic is, uh, mm. is something that's always a challenge. Um, but the other thing is you have so much rotational motion right. in um, figure skating that you don't have in the same way in speed skating. Oh, of course. With the rotations and the landings that I think um, people are a little more leery probably. Scared, of, like, let's just do this without. Sure. Well, but but, I think, but if they would strengthen. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's where I was going because, I mean, speaking as a former gymnast, you know, there's a lot of times where you're landing and rotating with some serious torque um, and mm -hmm. there's no gymnasts who have any real ankle support. Yeah, no, it, we definitely, I mean, we definitely thought that you've got to start this with the little kids. Yeah. Like, and then, cause as the little kids get 
you know, as they train and they get stronger and whatever, they won't even know the difference and right. their ankles will be fine and they will have, you know, foot muscles and lower leg muscles that can handle it. Um, but the problem is, again, in the skating community, getting buy-in because, you know, the parents of some competitive First of all, you have to have somebody who's who's competitive and gets right. results to be the example, right? right. Exactly. And then the parents of all the little kids want, you know, whatever the champions have, you know, and right. so it's a really hard, you really need like a really um, influential coach to buy in and get all their kids going. Well, this is, I mean, uh, I think you just nailed, like when people, when I love when people say things like, well, how come fill in the blank professional athlete is not wearing some minimalist shoe. It's like, cause mm -hmm. we're not paying him a shit ton of money to do that. Um, yeah. But I think, I think to your point though, the, at a certain point, there's going to be an opportunity for some serious athlete in any sport we can think of golf, mm -hmm. tennis, basketball, baseball, football, soccer. If I didn't already say that one, uh, I don't think bowling so much, but okay. <laughs> uh, miniature golf, probably not so much. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what was that thing this summer, that miniature golf show? What? Do you see the miniature golf show on ABC this summer? Oh my God. No, I would oh have loved gosh. that. <laughs> it's, it's on Hulu or something. It's like extreme mini golf. It's, 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 it's crazy. Anyway, right, I'm, I'm totally gonna look that up. I, wait, hold on. I I have a professional putters association ball that I won when I was 14 from uh, winning a miniature golf uh, championship, and uh, I still have that ball. Uh, you know, I'm telling you, <laughs> you could have been on this show. I mean, it was it was awesome. If yeah. it weren't for miniature golf, I don't think I'd be with my wife. I mean, our, a lot of our a lot of our courting in, was uh, happened over miniature golf. Nice, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> miniature awesome. golf and hot tubs. Those were our two things, and still are. Awesome. Um, so, um, so uh, wait, there was something. Oh, but yeah, if some you know major uh, sports personality has some, and they all have a reason, frankly, to make a change. But I say to professional athletes, I go, you know, don't go switching right away. Cause you know, you sorry, my son is here. <laughs> Hi. Come on in. <laughs> um, we're doing a video podcast. You're on, you're on kind of television right now. Wait, pick up your shoes. Oh yeah. Let's see what you're wearing. Yeah, Wait, right. Aaron, take your shoe off and, and show it to me. Okay. Let's see. Take your shoe off? Why? Yeah. Cause I'm going to show them what you're wearing. Oh, this is going to. Whoops. <laughs> See? Hey, check it out. Yeah. All right. There you go. I, I <laughs> must say, I, I must say, I'm upset. I'm not there to touch the floor with my socks. He is not big enough for your shoes yet. Oh, okay. All right. I know. Yeah, what size they shoes. start at? Like a three? Um, uh, 11. An el oh, 11. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He wears a one. Great. Oh, you didn't know. Did you not know we had a kid shoe? No. Oh, that's why. Yeah, we've got, it came out, um, came out in the fall, so. I know a guy who knows a guy. We'll see if we can hook you guys yeah, up. Yeah, all right, all right. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Now he's sorry. I, no, no. I just, I just, I just love. Um, this is my favorite thing. Is um, we don't have children because it would be <laughs> dangerous if we did. Because I'd be the kind of person saying things like, "Hey, stop jumping on that couch. The springs are better on this couch." <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yes. That. But anyway, yes. point being, at some point we'll have some real athlete who obviously has a reason to make the change and once they do and it's going to be all over we have a bunch of professional golfers who've been contacting contacting us saying that they train in our shoes oh, um, but they're not playing in them because they're getting so much money from their shoe sponsors right now uh -huh. so interesting. someday we hope that changes we have um uh, let's see if i can if i'm allowed to say this we have a professional athlete in a sport that is well known for ankle injuries who emailed us with a shoe about a shoe that we were testing with them. And the word was, um, I couldn't sprain my ankle in these if you paid me to. Oh, and nice. the, the issue is that people in this sport, if we're going to, if we're going to try and break in, we need to custom make shoes for everybody who's wearing them. And again, uh, we don't have that kind of cash yet, but at a certain point, um, sure. I think we can, we can change the world that way. Yeah. So, cool. so what did you discover in, in dealing with your, <laughs> this is great. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. Then, um, do you, what, what are you doing? Uh, I'm here to give that to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, are you going home now? For, for people who are just listening, there's a child who has taken over the entire podcast. I'm sorry. Randomly walking around in front of the camera, playing with some sort of toy that I wish I had. I don't know why. Okay, why don't you go out and find the other down there? And now, he's, uh, now we're trying to coax him away from the camera. The odds of that happening are really slim. I feel like I'm David Atten. <laughs> Okay, stop. Okay. 
So, All right, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, see ya. Woo! So, uh, Oh, yeah, we know what you're gonna find around here. Do you have any, do you have any dogs yeah. that can? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, we we have three office dogs who are here today. I'll see if I can get one. Oh, of them. nice. But they're yeah. all pretty. They're pretty low key. Um, one of them, I don't think, knows that I live here at all. It's, you know, <laughs> been here for a year and still doesn't know who I am. Awesome. Um, it's just awesome. really chill. So, <laughs> so in dealing with skaters, talk about what you've researched, what you discovered, and how that's relevant for people in the whole natural movement world. Um, well, so some of the stuff um, that we've done with skaters, I guess, um, well, there's not a whole lot of money in skating research. Talk about like another area that is, you know, hard oh, to break into, right? Like, so the skating well, research. Wait, I want to pause for a second. You would yeah. think, you would think that you could, that they're, well, again, hard to break in for the same reason professional sports, but you would think that hockey players would have some motivation to really look into you know, how, how to stay alive and stay on the, in the wrinkle. Yeah. Area. So concussion research is relatively popular. Or, I mean, there's a lot of people doing concussion research and there are some people doing, um, hockey biomechanics research, okay. Canada though, you know, uh, <laughs> um, and it's like, I want to say there's two universities that have a, that have setups that really do the hockey stuff with figure skating. There's very, very little, um, that's been done and so you know for there's a while a ton, you know there's tons of money for pairs dance skate whatever the hell that's called i'm totally making that up um it's like you know all the, it's all, all that money for synchronized swimming research they're just, oh right exactly i mean they're going in yes. yeah exactly so yes it's kind <laughs> yeah. of like that um dancing. And, that's the phrase i couldn't I think of yes yeah, there, there you go um yeah so for a while there was um a they were trying to figure out how to change the boots because that really, I mean, I think everybody involved with skating and the care of um, the skaters as athletes um, pretty much agrees that the boots are a problem. Um, but there's, you know, four or five boot companies in the world. Um, they have a pretty small market, right. you know, as it is. So they're not rushing to try to change things. And then you have that one company that did change things with the articulated boot, but ran into problems. And, you know, at some point they just, we got to cut our losses and like, right. you know, go back to the, the standard. So changing the boots is really challenging. Um, right. and that is not something that we've, you know, that anybody has really figured out an answer to yet. Um, other things um, that, in conversation with some of the um, medical personnel that deal with like the U.S. figure skating team athletes, um, they they do talk about weakness of foot muscles, weakness um, of hip muscles. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, like when they'll they'll often do um, single leg landing tests, like in the office or something, and you can just see the knee like collapsing in it's ridiculous like that's this it. is what you do like this is this is the move <laughs> like that's how you land everything you know and and they can't control it and so um so that's definitely something like and even i would say you know 30 years ago or so there was no cross training in figure skating so, i mean it was you just go skate and you just do your things over and over again and now at least there's off ice training you know and dance and stuff like that right. So I think but, well, you know, runners, of course, are very much the same way. You know, distance runners in particular, they want to run and don't right. do anything else, despite yeah. the fact that doing that causes the problems that doing something else would cure. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's don't really even. Yeah, exactly. I mean, don't even get started on um, sports mm -hmm. specialization, right? Like right. kids. And anyway, um, so um, yeah. So what we've been doing recently with skating, we have been. Well, we've been, there's two projects that we're working on now. One is um, instrumenting a figure skating blade so that we can actually get uh, measurements of their landing forces on the ice because we actually don't even have that. Like, oh, interesting. Nobody actually knows. Um, any studies that have, taught, that have measured landing forces and figure skaters have done it um, off ice in a lab, having a skater jump like backwards from a box onto a force plate on um, artificial ice or something like that, which right. clearly is going to be very different. Um, so we've been working on instrumenting a blade so that we can get on ice landing forces. It's a long, it has been a long project <laughs> and it's been really challenging. Um, um, but that's, that's one thing because that's really a starting point, right? Like we don't even right. know what we're dealing with until we know the impact forces. 
and then and what influences them um, specifically with skating and then um, the other thing we've been working on is an activity monitor um, like a sort of like a Fitbit for skating um, but something that will count the number of jumps the skaters do they will give them their rotation speed and time in the air or jump height or something along those lines so we've been working on developing that too which does maybe doesn't have too much to do <laughs> I, I just like the idea um uh, you know if anyone thinks that academia is somehow not connected to the real world boy you just proved it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know but it's so fun <laughs> no i'm jealous projects and yeah <laughs> no i think that's awesome i mean but and and it is fascinating um it just you know uh, i think the application to hot dog vendors might be really high in some way that we haven't identified or uh, right <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so given, given that skaters are, for all practical purposes, um, putting their feet in casts for hours a day, what are you seeing or what have you done anything about that or what do you see with that? Um, I mean, so I think that, I mean, I would love to test skaters foot strength, you know, as mm. we have, now we just like want to throw everybody into the foot strength device and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, get these measurements. But I think it would be interesting um, to get skaters, um, given how much time they spent doing activity in basically a cast. Um, and then really, I mean, I think it is, it is going to be, um, they could do strengthening obviously, right. um, but also um, changing the boots. Um, I mean, they are probably do quite a bit of dance. So yeah. you think that should hopefully strengthen. Um, but I don't know, you know, we just don't have, we just don't have the data. Like, I, you know, it's hard to no. say. And no, when they I are, I'm just going back to the whole the whole speed skating clap skate thing where I'm just thinking if there's any you know if there were any opportunity to articulate the ankle or the foot in some way I mean I can't imagine that wouldn't be beneficial if there was a way of figuring out the 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 um the engineering of it Yeah no I agree I mean it definitely it makes sense like yeah it's logical it just again, you know, breaking into these, this market and, you know, having somebody who has enough money to do something about it and, you know, and to, you know, do it well. And yeah. Well, it, all, it also occurs to me that if someone actually did make that, the odds are pretty high that it would be banned immediately because <laughs> they'd have, they, they'd have a patent on it. They'd have, you know, the, the rights and everybody else would huh. freak out. Sort of like there was, I don't know if you know, there was a thing, um, Puma made a, a sprinting spike. It was, they call it a brush spike. So instead of big metal things, it had like a bunch of little things, like literally imagine, um, a whisk brush, just, you know, glued to your shoe. And, um, there were some runners who did really well wearing it. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, probably inaccurately, people concluded that they did well because of the shoe, but then the shoe was suddenly magically banned. And the argument was, well, it's bad for the track. It's like, really? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, go, I, go take a look at a Mondo track after one year of people running on it. There's nothing that's good for that track. <laughs> um, so yeah. the idea that, you know, these little things are, are somehow worse for it is ridiculous. Um, but it's funny. It, it, it really is interesting to me how in the running world, pe if someone does well, the first thing people assume is, well, it's got to be the shoes. Mm, that's interesting. I, I did a, I did a yeah. podcast, uh, or more accurately, a rant like a week <laughs> or two ago about the sub two hour marathon. Uh -huh. And my, my basic position was, look, Kipchoge running sub two hours, it's amazing. But this guy was already the most amazing athlete that you could find for the marathon. He ran a 201.38. That was his world record. And then he runs two minutes faster under ideal circumstances, that's right. less that's less than five seconds per mile different. And you think it's because of the shoes? Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> so what, um, I, I haven't asked you this and, and it occurred to me to do it. Uh, you know, I'm really, how do I want to put this? I don't like using the word passionate, but but I know people will. I'm very, very attached to the whole phenomenon of promoting natural movement. I mean, it made a big difference for me. It made a big difference for my wife and now for hundreds of thousands of people that have gotten into, into zero shoes and other minimalist, truly minimalist footwear. 
And it also really motivates me because there are big companies making a lot of money doing things that are demonstrably not good for people. And that just infuriates me. Um, so, and, and something Irene Davis said to me early on, which is if we just get kids wearing shoes like yours in 20 years, we won't be treating adults for the problems that they currently have. And that's also highly motivating, even for someone who doesn't have children. Um, and it's not just because we like the idea of changing the world. I, we like the idea of changing the world. I don't care if anyone knows that I had anything to do with it or my wife feels the same way, but it's an important thing. This is my position. I have no idea what your fundamental philosophical take is about the whole natural movement thing, given what you've done and what you might have in the works. Yeah. Um, well, my kids wear minimal shoes. <laughs> as you can see. Says something. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I do feel like it makes so much sense. Like, I think, you know, when we got into this, at least for me, when we started that first um, fiber, the running transition study, I was interested because I'm interested in preventing overuse injuries, um, particularly in athletics and in these landings and things like that. Um, and so that's how I got interested. And as we've kind of gone down this route of what what is going on at the foot? Like, what, is the right. foot, what does the foot do? Right. Um, you Why know, do we the have role, you know, what's, yeah. our, what's the role in, um, you know, in, in the force absorption and mm -hmm. the protection of, you know, of the impacts through the rest of the body. Um, that's kind of what has gotten me really interested and kept me kind of going on this, on this route. And then the idea of being able to prevent um, foot problems in, um, I don't know, just as you age, right? We yeah. just, we just yeah. um, tested a whole bunch of people down at the senior games in um, the Huntsman World Senior Games in right. St. George. St. George. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, and it's fascinating to see like 120 people's feet. <laughs> but, you know, I've been doing a variety of things over right. the years, but like, you know, just getting a sense for um, how, you know, what happens as you age too. Yeah. And, you know, um, have you talked to Bell Seiko yet? Um, I've talked, I, I, I've talked to Bell at a couple of events, but we haven't done this yet. Okay. And yeah, her research on, did, was that research with just women or was it mixed? I can't remember. It was women with, um, uh, neosteoarthritis. neosteoarthritis, right. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know, I've talked about it before. The short version is wearing minimal shoes, not even ideal minimal shoes, frankly, but wearing minimal shoes, their not knee osteoarthritis one way is the easiest way to put it. Um, a little glib, but nonetheless, I mean, it's something that it, it's something that, um, most people would tell you couldn't happen. Right. And yeah. you know, that's, that was really fun. Yeah. They, they took less pain medication. They had less, lower joint loading at the knee. Yeah. Um, and so there were, yeah, I mean, like and, 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 and that does seem totally counterintuitive to put somebody who has osteoarthritis in minimalist shoes. And well, yet, again, it seems counterintuitive it, only because, it, well, because it seems obvious for reasons that it shouldn't that cushioning must be good. And if you get rid of it, that must be bad. And I love to point out a couple of things. I go, well, first of all, foam, any kind of cushioning, doesn't matter what it is, any kind of cushioning is basically tuned to a particular force, particular weight, particular speed. And you are probably not uh, hitting it with that force, or certainly not all the time, but almost always never. Um, secondly, it, it breaks down almost immediately. Uh, and I, I saw some research, Brian Heiderscheidt showed this, I hadn't seen it before. He had done some research on foam where they were just basically banging it over and over and over to see how fast it wears out. And mm -hmm. shoe companies love to say, well, replace your shoes every three to 500 miles. And he saw that where, how badly the foam had degraded it was basically not at all different between 200 miles and 300 miles and really not much different between 100 miles and 200 miles. <laughs> it really turned into crap at about 60 miles. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's another thing I did a video. Oh my God. I, I took a video. I was in the airport. There's a guy walking in front of me uh, in a pair of regular motion controlled padded shoes and he's falling off the insides. I mean, just completely yeah. falling off the insides. The pad uh -huh. the foam had totally degraded. And we, we posted this, this is going to say a lot about the world. We posted it on a Facebook and people were making, I, I would call it the appropriate comments about how these shoes are not great for you. Uh, uh -huh. We posted it on Instagram and people accused us of body shaming. It's like, no, 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 no. That was not the point. No. Shoe shaming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's what we were doing. So uh, that was just incredible. But um, uh, so, and the thing I say is, given all of these things about foam, which would you rather have? Some man-made thing that breaks down and is not tuned for you or a 
almost instantaneously adjustable, almost not intimately, but massively adjustable spring mechanism that's built into your body that just doesn't really wear out. Mm -hmm. And everyone goes, well, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But we've been so taught that there's a, um, a mechanical or, or product solution to almost every problem. And again, cushioning feels good the moment you put it on. That just doesn't mean it's good for you, as all the research that Christine Pollard's doing, showing the more cushioning, the more impact forces you have. So mm -hmm. or at least they don't get reduced. I mean, it's, it's not really counterintuitive, but in a way it is. And so it's, a, it's kind of a goofy thing. And I, I think that people just need to have the experience, I mean, look, I, the number of people that I know who switched to something like a Hoka or some other maximalist, maximally cushioned shoe, who for the first six months, first year even, were going, oh my God, these are amazing. They're allowing me to run. And uh -huh. at the two year mark, I'm going, oh my God, I can't run. My knees are shot. Yeah. It's super, super high. Um, but again, that research is not going to get much attention because mm -hmm. there's not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of product behind it. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, what, uh, what's on the horizon? What do you, what would you, I'm going to ask a fun question. If you had unlimited resources, what would you want to study? I mean, I'd love to do follow up, like a long-term type study, right. um, you know, starting with kids, you know, or different age groups and kind of following them along for a while and seeing how their feet, um, well, kids with how their feet develop and then older people like, you know, changing their footwear and seeing what happens. Does. Um, you want to talk about blood flow? Stuff? Yeah, we're looking at um, blood flow and the effect of narrow toe box shoes on the blood <laughs> going into the into the foot, and we measured a sixty percent drop just by taking the big toe and moving it over towards the other toes. And that oh drop, my god! Um, for some people, were able to come back up, but on average, they stayed down thirty percent. And wow! Um, and now we want to keep working with that and to see what happens when you're actually in a shoe and you do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what's is this leading to the development of plantar fasciopathy and some of these other problems? Well, where I'm going I'm going sort of in the opposite direction because um I'm not making any medical claims when I say this, but given what you just said, it's going to make it'll be intuitively obvious. The number of people who've told us that they had things uh like Raynaud's or diabetic neuropathy or yeah. other other foot related issues who once they're in something that lets their toes spread and bend yeah. and flex and move, you know, they find some relief. And I go, well, it's not surprising. You're, and arthritis too. You're moving and improving circulation. I mean, that's right. going to be a big deal. Yeah. And again, not really well researched at all at this point. Um, <laughs> right. uh, and something that most, most medical professionals will tell you the exact opposite. You need to get in a big, thick. Jesus, there was a, um, there was a video that I saw, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, sponsored some research from a product uh, called, I think, Vibe Forward. Don't hold me to it, but I think I'm right. And it's a vibrating thing. You put it on your ankle. And they showed that when they use this thing, Parkin people with Parkinson's symptoms uh, would suddenly would walk better. They could just, you could see their mobility was way improved. And I said, I immediately looked in our, in our email um, database and on our website for people who had left reviews with the words Parkinson's and found all these people saying, oh, wow, you know, my Parkinson's symptoms uh, seem to go away or are reduced when I'm wearing a minimalist shoe. And my response is, you don't need a magic vibrator. You just need to use your feet. And when you look at the shoes that the people were wearing in this study, this Vibe Forward study, massively big thick stiff ridiculous shoes that you know you you can't move in mm -hmm. right and 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 these were shoes that were clearly recommended to these people it's like right. how does this make any sense yeah uh, it just mystifies me yeah yeah this is, this is what obviously <laughs> i mean you know I, I wish we had the kind of resources where we could just start sponsoring the research and get the word out there even though and I'm, I'm going to head into an entertaining direction, even though fundamentally all the work you're doing is for nothing. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you why I say that. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm being, I'm being facetious, but it's something like um, when Irene has her science of running medicine events mm -hmm. and is presenting to physical therapists, her very, very lucid and clearly laid out step by step explanation of how modern athletic shoes cause the problems they claim to cure and how getting out of them into something that actually lets your foot move naturally can actually be a big part of the cure for some people the entire thing others some gait retraining is involved as well <clears throat> i said you know i said to her after you're done talking people should run out of the room tackle me and steal all my shoes 
but they don't. What happens is half the room will come out and check out what I'm doing and a half of them, a quarter of the room total, will get really into what we're doing. But 75% go back to what, what they were already doing. And the question is why? And my proposal, my supposition, is that human being, well, they, they, the people who are in that room, trained professionals that they are, they think that they made a rational choice for wearing the shoes they're wearing. Even if that rational choice was listening to some 21 year old kid in a footwear store who just repeated something that he was taught by a shoe sales person from a company. And the thing that we know about human psychology is that we don't like to change our minds, that, um, that presenting new data, contradictory data to something we already believe usually locks in the existing belief instead of changes it in any way. So all the research is at best um, giving ammunition to the people who are already true believers. And actually that's good. And at best taking the people who are maybe in the middle who don't know yet and giving them something, but there, there's a big giant swath that you can tell them if you wear those shoes, you will get cancer. Your kids won't get into college and you won't be able to use the number three anymore. And they'll still go, yeah, but I like them. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is the thing that I'm really curious about is how do we take the information that we have and, and how do you, what makes things change? What makes people change? And I don't have the answer, um, but you know, obviously I want to have these conversations as part of the answer. Hopefully it'll be part of the answer. Right. You know, it's a, it's a really tricky thing that, um, it, that, I mean, I love the work that you guys are doing. I so want to try and figure out how to turn it into something that makes people go, Oh geez. Right. And try something different. And that's yeah. the magic question that's the holy grail yeah, yeah yeah for sure so come on what do you recommend yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any thoughts just keep doing it right just yeah get it out there and get feet stronger get people moving and and that and they'll start spreading the word more but it's going to take a lot of time yeah and i think i mean you know, one of the things with academia is, you know, we do a bit preach to the choir, right? Yeah. Like we talk to each other at conferences, <laughs> you know, and so kind of getting out of some of those, like when we have results that really are um, applicable to a pathology or something like with the blood flow stuff, like if you right, know, that's get to the point where we can really see super cool, you know, make it like a no brainer, like here's yeah. the connection, right? Then going to places, um, you know, conferences that physicians attend, maybe that family physicians right. attend or something to be able to try to get it to them, you know, and physical therapists and stuff and trying to get it to those people who can get it to the general public Yeah. or, um, you know, there's a writer at like, uh, the New York Times, who does a lot of stories on running, like a lot of the opinion pieces and stuff on running. Um, she wrote up the Vibram study when we, the first Wait, one that we did. Gretchen, Gretchen Reynolds. Oh, okay. And, you know, but like that gets a lot of attention, right? Yeah. When you, now what, is that going to convince anybody? I don't know, but at least it gets it out, yeah. right? Maybe somebody's thinking about it. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I think you're right. Like word of mouth. Again, well, the word, of, word of mouth is definitely the big thing. I mean, when I think about it, I say, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to create a grassroots groundswell because when people have the experience, when people put on a shoe that doesn't squeeze your toes together, that lets you move, <laughs> yeah. lets you feel, you know, it's an eye-opening experience. The more people have that at a certain point, there's a, there's a um, critical mass and things shift. And the other thing is doing the top-down version that we talked about earlier, you know, getting influential people who mm -hmm. can, who can um, tell a convincing and real story. The challenge, of course, with those kind of people, frankly, is that many of them are, I think the technical term is nuts. Um, you know, at any you given have to, level. Be, to be, you know, yeah. that good at something. You know, oh, also. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I say that with nothing but respect. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you know at any given point, someone who is your best spokesperson could go off the rails uh, and be doing something a little crazy. So there's there's a bit of a catch-22 with there, or push yeah. and pull you, uh, or something. It's tough, is the bottom line. Nothing, way. yes. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, the experience is definitely is definitely the thing that, that makes people get it. And it's funny, well, I'll have that happen here where people will – put on one of our shoes, they'll go walk or walking around. There's like their eyes pop out and they go, well, wait, don't I need arch support? And it's like, I don't know. How'd you feel just now? They go, well, fine. I go, then you don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, take your time, let your foot build up some strength. So, um, uh, so let me kind of jump into the, the end of this. If people want to find out more about what you've been up to or just in general, where, where should they go other than stalking you, which we don't want them to do. Well, I mean, you know, um, where, yeah, we don't have a, 
we keep trying to get a website up, but we're not yeah. very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is this is another issue with academics, right? Like we are not salespeople. <laughs> we right. are not marketing of ourselves. Like we're terrible at that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I mean, most of our stuff ends up in at conferences and things. Well, well, the simple thing: if someone goes to PubMed and they search for your names, yeah, yeah, Google Scholar. Uh, Google Scholar, yeah. Okay, like, okay, you know, yeah. and they. Anyway, <laughs> uh, cause, because I mean, I, I do think it's important for people to, to see this. And I think it's also important. And I wish there was a, something we could do about this uh, for people to learn how to read a study. Because, so much. Yeah. man, some of the stuff that's been, quote, anti barefoot could not have been more poorly yeah. done. And uh, people don't know it. I, there's a, a guy here who's um, I, I won't mention him by name, but his initials are Roger Crom. And Roger, um, I actually, I like Roger very much, but yeah. I said to him, you know, when you, when you put out a study and it's got 10 people who you say are, we mentioned this earlier, habitual barefoot runners, and I know those people and they are not, you know, that, that's a challenge. And, and people don't know, or when you say, you know, that, that the Nike Vaporfly, everyone who wears it had a 4% improvement in VO2 max, but there's no real correlation between yeah. VO2 max and performance because otherwise if Kipchoge put on the vapor fly he'd run four percent faster which is way more than two minutes over the course mm -hmm. of a marathon uh, so you know it, like people don't people don't know how to look at this stuff and it's hard because it's written not for normal humans right yeah yeah, academics. yeah. Uh, and, and I wish there was you know some way of uh, and maybe that's maybe that's actually the thing is someone needs to do academic to English translations yeah yeah, and, really. yeah. Really they're good. definitely. I feel like you know, there's more open access journals these days and stuff too. And I'm wondering how long it is before something like Plus One says, "Okay, now put you know, give a layperson summary of your yeah. article yeah. in addition to your scientific article and abstract and all that kind of stuff." Like yeah, yeah, yeah. now, yeah. you know, do something that like anybody can read and and actually understand what you were doing. But uh, but yeah, it's it, it. There is a disconnect. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. There's all these things there. I mean, I one of what the day that I started Zero Shoes, which was almost ten years ago, um, and it was then Invisible Shoes. My first thought after I put up the website was, I've got to find a way to create some sort of umbrella organization to collect all this information, to put it in some usable format, to have some PR people who are talking to the press in a way on a regular basis, so that when some news comes out, you know, there's a voice that's not just. Um, uh, shoes are awesome and anything else is going to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not something that I have the ability to do now, but is way high on my fantasy to do list. Mm -hmm. And, and hopefully we'll be able to be part of making that happen at some point in a way that doesn't make it feel like it's just, um, propaganda. More propaganda from yeah. this side now. Like, yeah. yeah. Now the, yeah. the joke there is, uh, that when people say, well, there's like a debate about natural movement. I say, well, uh -huh. no, there's not. There's people who say we're wrong and they're wrong. <laughs> there's there's no debate <laughs> and people go no no there's a debate it's like no go take a look at the, if you look at the research there's really no debate yeah and uh, but people don't want to go there yeah. yep it's true it's challenging well on that note that makes us all want to cry yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> man. <laughs> well, um, I, I, first of all, I just want to thank you both for being here. Um, it's been a total, total treat. Um, I, I, I wish there was some way that we could, another thing we could do is like, you know, have, actually, I thought of this the other day. I wish we had some way of just collecting money from people to support research. Like if we had an app that every minimalist shoe company was able to put on the checkout page of their thing saying, you know, would oh, you yeah. like to donate a dollar or 10% or whatever it is to support research? Yeah. Um, pro and con. I mean, I'm, you know, yeah. if someone, right. I don't sure. care. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm research agnostic. Uh, you know, that, I think that would be a really cool tool. We yeah. have, have, some, awesome. have to collect that somewhere and have it accounted for appropriately. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So that we get we get research and Lamborghinis. I mean, that right? Be <laughs> exactly. I mean, we have to drive ourselves the places that we're going to walk <laughs> and fast, <laughs> and you got to get there quickly. Right. Exactly. And in style. <laughs> you got stuff to do. You got you got you got to collect another sixty people for a study. Exactly. Right. Exactly. 
Yes. Well, thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> total, total pleasure. And again, um, uh, let's, if you can send me, so I can put it in the show notes, whatever you can about how people can actually do some foot strengthening. We've talked about it a little bit, but, it, but it'd be really fun to, to post that for people uh, and give them something they can do. And of course, we just want to hear what their experience is. So as my sign off goes, um, for those of you listening, watching, et cetera, thank you so much for being here and putting up for uh, my crazy hair day. And Sarah, just that one flyaway that you had. Uh, all good now. <laughs> calm down. Yeah, mine did not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in all the various places you can. If you have something you want to email us, drop an email to move at jointhemovementmovement.com. And again, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe and like and share and review and do all those things that you know how to do. Uh, but most importantly, enjoy, have fun, and live life feet first.